glad you could be here today, and welcome to those of you who are joining online. I'm glad you're here with us as well. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements, and then I'll open in prayer. We'll have our children's church video and then worship through song. Uh, but remind you of the opportunities to give. Uh, we have many remote giving opportunities as well as offering plates uh, in the back. Um, we have a business meeting Wednesday, January 27th. That's at 7 p.m. So please uh, put that on your calendars. Today is National Sanctity of Human Life Day. Um, it's something that we probably often um, miss in our lives. Um, it's the Sunday that's closest to the day in which Roe versus Wade uh, took place uh, several years ago. But on this day, we need to celebrate God's gift of life. Uh, he is the creator. He's the one that breathes life into each of us. Also commemorate the lives that have been lost to abortion across the world and especially in our country. A uh, very sad thing. And then also commit to protect human life in all stages, all ages. So uh, we'll, we need to focus on that and be reminded of that and pray that God will bring healing to our country and, and that he will uh, give us as a church. It's our responsibility to lead that change. Um, and also, we need to be praying especially for our country this week. Uh, Maybe a challenging week. And we don't need to pray for unity. That's not going to occur. But we need to be praying that God will bring us together to be able to have conversations instead of bringing, bringing ourselves to violence. So I'm going to open us in prayer. Um, and then in, after the songs, I'll be introducing Mr. Ken Keithley, who's with us today. Thankful to have him here. And he'll be uh, opening God's word and teaching us today. So let's pray. God, we do thank you that uh, we come, have been able to come together, Lord. We know that we are your church, not this building, but those of us who are believers in this room. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you. God, I pray that you will um, have a very real presence in this service today. Lord, that we will humble ourselves Lord, we will evaluate our lives during this prayer, Lord, to make sure there's nothing in between us and you. If there is, Lord, that we will repent of it and turn from it. God, I pray that you will just bless the service. Lord, we are so thankful that we have the ability to worship you. God, I pray that you will uh, touch this country, Lord, as we enter into a week of transition. God, that we will trust in you in all things. Lord, that we will depend upon you, Lord, as we may meet with others and talk with others who um, have different viewpoints, Lord, that we will be able to share the love of Christ with them, Lord, to do it in love. Lord, we pray that um, you will just help us to, um, Lord, step forth whenever those opportunities uh, occur, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you will... Help us to understand how precious life is. Lord, these blessings that you have bestowed upon us. Lord, help us to be vocal and, and support those, Lord, who are um, Lord, just working to ensure that, um, that children can come into this world, Lord, that aren't aborted. Lord, I pray that you forgive us, Lord, as a country for the ills that have taken place. God, I pray that uh, as we enter into this time of of song, Lord, that we will worship you, and Lord, that we will just understand the words that we're singing, Lord, that you will accept our praise as we return it back to you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, KMBC kids. I wonder how many of you like to sit down to your meal or your snack and have your drink full of nice cold ice cubes. There's just something about those ice cubes that makes the drink taste better, isn't there? And you know, if you have a refrigerator with an automatic ice maker, you can have ice anytime you want without doing a thing. But I wonder how many of you have ever seen one of these. If you have, then you know it's an ice tray. And you know, it's pretty simple. You just fill each one of these little pockets with water, and then you stick it in the freezer, and after a few hours, when you pull it out, you can have ice cubes. But you know, if you don't wait long enough, you may get something that looks frozen on the outside, but within just a few minutes of putting it in your drink, that outside layer of ice has thawed and the water that's left inside is now part of your drink and your drink's kind of watery. So if you don't wait, you don't get the payoff that you were really hoping for with a nice 
cold ice cube. And you know, sometimes we kind of are impatient in life. I bet there are some of you that just can't wait for the school day to end. Or maybe if I asked you to raise your hand and say, oh, I can't wait for Christmas or my birthday or another special activity or trip that your family is going to have. You know, I bet there's some of you too that would say, I can't wait to grow up and I can't wait to be able to drive. But you know, if all we ever do is spend our time being impatient and thinking, oh, I can't wait, then we're going to miss some of the good things that God provides for us each and every day if we're patient and we're paying attention to what's going on around us. You know, the Bible reminds us in Galatians 5.22 that patience is one of the fruits of the Spirit. And then in Hebrews 10.36, it tells us that we need patience so that after we've done God's will, we might receive the promise. So, you know, we need to be patient. We need to wait because good things come in the waiting. So boys and girls, the next time you're impatient, I hope you'll think about the ice tray and how we have to wait in order to get an ice cube that's really going to do its job. Boys and girls, I hope you have a great week this week, and until next time, God bless. Please stand and join us in worship this morning. Welcome to Kenley Missionary Baptist Church. As we begin to focus upon um, who God is and how worthy he is for uh, worship, uh, we just pray that uh, our hearts will be tuned to him. We can focus upon him and um, thank him for all that he's done in our lives. Let's raise our voices together. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to Him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Yeah.
filled with wonder, awestruck wonder, at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power. It's awesome to be in the house of the Lord and to be able to lift our voices together as one church body. But how amazing is it going to be one day when we get to stand up and join with the angels and sing in heaven whenever we all get together and uh, proclaim him as Lord together forever. Holy, holy, holy. Join together now as we sing holy, holy, holy. y'all, but I'm excited to be here this morning. This feels good, doesn't it? I am so excited, and I, uh, it's been a while since we did what I like to call a happy song. This song's got a good clap to it, so I uh, encourage you to follow along. This is just a song I really enjoy. It's fun, and uh, just enjoy uplifting the name of Christ with me this morning. <laughs> God spoke and the prophets wrote it down It's a holy treasure leather bound 
There's power in everything he said From Genesis to the words in red Straight on through to the revelation 66 books pointing to salvation Hear the word of the Lord Having mercy on the lost See the word of the Lord Hanging on a rugged cross Where the Lamb was slain and the debt was paid A way was made with an empty grave The best news you've heard Hear the word of the Lord When the voices of this world cry out Try to fill your mind with fear and doubt it's just the latest lie I'm telling you And the Bible speaks eternal truth When the works of men are crushed and burning The holy pages will still be turning Hear the word of the Lord Having mercy on the lost See the word of the Lord Hanging on a rugged cross there the lamb was slain and the debt was paid A way was made with an empty grave The best news you've heard Hear the word of the Lord It's a living, breathing testimony From the Father's one and only Son Who gave himself to pay for sin I'll say it again Having mercy on the lost See the word of the Lord Hanging on a rugged cross There the lamb was slain and the debt was paid A way was made with an empty grave The best news you've heard Hear the word of the Lord The lamb was slain and the debt was paid A way was made with an empty grave All the best news you've heard Hear the word of the Lord. Thank you, Ethan. That was great. As I mentioned, Pastor uh, Mr. Ken Keithley, he's with us today, and his wife, Miss Penny. We're thankful uh, for them being here with us. Uh, I won't share many words. I'll allow uh, Mr. Ken to do that. He knows himself better than I know him. But uh, he has been um, a pastor for many years, uh, a good portion as a full-time pastor, and then also has assisted several churches as an interim pastor. And uh, in addition to his position as a professor of theology at Southeastern, so again, thank you for being here. Thank and you. remember, our main focus today is to dig into God's Word, and He's going to lead us with that. So thank you, sir. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate that. I think I'm on. Does it sound like I'm on? Good, good, because last service I goofed up, and it's not the first time I've ever goofed up. Probably won't be the last. Good to see everybody. All glad to be here? Say amen. amen. I want to thank uh, Kevin for leading us in worship and the worship team. Thank you, Matt, for that nice introduction. Ethan, thank you for reminding us about the Word of God and its power. If you have your Bibles, turn to Acts, the 12th chapter, the 12th chapter to the book of Acts. My name is Ken Keithley. Say three first names and you have it right. Ken Keith Lee, uh, and, and you, you've been able to say my name. My wife, Penny, is here, and um, I bring her along to, because she makes me look good. And uh, so I'm glad that she's with, uh, uh, with me this morning. We have two grown children, a son and a daughter. They're both married. Uh, our daughter and her husband live in the D.C. area. Our son and his wife um, lives uh, in Wake Forest, and they have four kids. So the four grandkids live near to us, which is a blessing. We're from the Ozarks of Missouri, for we're from the Midwest before I came out to come to school. And uh, so I've been a, a pastor for nearly 15 years full time before I became a prof. 
And as a professor, yes, I've done a number of interim pastorates because quite honestly, I love the church. I love the opportunity to preach. I don't consider myself a professor who preaches. I consider myself a pastor who teaches. And so I'm, I'm very glad to have the opportunity to be with all of you here this morning. Well, uh, Acts chapter 12, I want to speak to you this morning on Asleep in the Electric Chair. Now, I realize that title may seem a bit odd, but I think as we go along, you'll see where I got it. And um, I don't know what the habit is at Kinley, but if you don't mind, and if you're able to, I realize some that's a challenge, uh, I, I understand that better than I used to. If you're able to stand, would you please stand while I read God's Word? I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version, and I'm going to read from Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through 5, even though I'm going to preach further a few more verses than that. Please uh, listen as I read aloud. Acts chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to Harris, some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. And so when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Acts chapter 12 is a tale of two men, Herod Agrippa and Simon Peter. The chapter begins with one in control and the other hopeless, or, or uh, without power, powerless I guess I should say. The chapter ends with the tables entirely turned. In fact, the chapter ends with a rather gruesome thing that happens. Um, <clears throat> two different men, two different roads, two different paths, and they end up in two different destinations. Now, I suspect that most of you are like me, that you've already read the chapter many times before. You've already been in Sunday school or vacation Bible school, and you know how this chapter works out. But what if all you had were these five verses? Which one of the two men would you want to be? Which of the two men would you prefer to be if all you knew is what I've told you here? That Herod Agrippa is the, is the one in charge and he sees that it's politically expedient to execute Christians, particularly the apostles. He's already killed James, the brother of John, and the Jews liked it so much, he says, well, I'll kill another one. And so he's arrested Simon Peter. It's the Passover. It's the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So he's going to wait until that's over. It's the night at daylight, at daybreak. P Simon Peter will also be beheaded. Um, which of the two would you rather be if this is all you know? I would say, in fact, the point that I'm going, this chapter is making is that even if this is all you know, I'd still rather be Simon Peter than Herod Agrippa. You say, why is that? And I think every Christian knows the answer. There are things that Simon Peter has in his life. There are blessings that he enjoys. Gifts that he has been given. Benefits that he experiences that is completely absent from Herod Agrippa. In fact, the point of this chapter is that it's better to be a believer on death row than it is to be a prince in a palace and not know God. And so you see, there are, this is a Baptist sermon, so you know it's going to have three points, don't you? Uh, there are three things here that we see in this chapter that believers enjoy, that unbelievers don't. That Simon Peter has going for him, that Herod Agrippa doesn't. And so let's take a look at these three things in the few minutes that we have. First, I want you to see that Simon Peter, just like you and I, we have the refuge of prayer. Look at verse 5. It says, But Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Simon Peter is in jail 
His colleague has been executed. He is scheduled to die in the morning. But the church makes a pivotal decision. They have decided to pray. Now, they're going to pray despite the fact that the situation, humanly speaking, looks hopeless. And I'm going to be honest with you this morning, and I have to tell you that there are times that my prayer life does really well, and then there are times that my prayer life struggles. When I look at those times that my prayer life struggles, whenever I'm not praying as I should, I, 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 can, I can point to some of the things in this passage as the reasons why sometimes I don't pray as I should. First is, I sometimes get discouraged when the situation looks humanly hopeless. There just doesn't look like any way it's going to work out. I mean, you look at it, what it says in verse 4, it says that from a human perspective, there's no hope for him. Because it says there are four squads of soldiers guarding him. There are three iron gates protecting him. There are two iron chains holding him. From a human perspective, it doesn't look like there's any way that this man is going to be delivered. And so there are times, I have to tell you, that whenever someone has got a chronic situation and it looks seriously bad, that sometimes I struggle uh, in praying for them. But just to be honest with you, and you know, is that it isn't sometimes the human situations that I struggle with. Even more so, what we see is that uh, God sometimes is his actions look bewildering and he, he his, he's divinely inscrutable. There are just times that I can't figure out what in the world God is doing. In fact, if I'd lived back then and they said, hey, the church is going to meet at Mary's house and we're going to pray all night for, for Simon Peter that God will deliver him, it would have been my tendency to say, why? James was killed. Do you think God loves Simon Peter more than James? Why should we expect God to treat Simon Peter any differently than he treated James? And let's face it, we all struggle with this. This is something that we all deal with and wonder why. Why is it two people diagnosed with cancer? We pray for both. One is delivered, the other succumbs to the disease. Two men are in financial trouble. We pray for both. One gets a promotion and a new job, and his situation is better. The other continues to struggle. Two families are having problems, and we pray for both. And one, uh, the marriage is healed, and the other doesn't go well. What in the world is going on whenever we pray like that, and we struggle to understand? And while we're at it, <clears throat> what in the world is prayer doing? Think about it for a second. What exactly are we doing when we pray? Are we telling God something He didn't already know? I don't think so. Are we talking Him into doing something He otherwise wouldn't do? Man, I hope not. Think about it for a second. God is all wise and God is all good. If you could talk God into doing something He otherwise wouldn't do, would you really want to? So what is going on when we pray? Well, let me just give you a few ideas of what's happening when we pray. You need to understand that God has been taking care of you all morning. In fact, you have experienced a thousand blessings already, 10,000 blessings in which God has been caring for you, watching over you, dealing with you. God has been intimately involved in each and every person in this room. All this week, this morning, there, without you even thinking about it, all right, without you asking for it, God takes care of us in a magnificent and marvelous way without us ever asking. But God is on mission. God has a task that He's doing in the world today. And He's allowed us believers, us, the church, to enter into what He is doing. And so God has, as sovereign God ordained, that there are certain benefits, certain blessings, certain goods that we are to receive them through the ministry of prayer. And by the ministry of prayer, we're able to enter into the burdens of others. We're able to enter into the task of God. And we're able to take part in what He is accomplishing. 
And so, what can we know when we pray? Two things, two wonderful, glorious things we can know when we pray. First, things that otherwise would not have happened will happen because we pray. And second, when we leave it in the hands of God, the best thing that ought to happen will happen because we left it in His hands. And so the church makes a pivotal decision to pray. Not only do they make a pivotal decision, notice they pray in the proper direction. Look again is what it says. Verse 5. So therefore, constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. You say, well, isn't all prayer to God? And the answer is, no, not really. The fact of the matter is, a lot of times our prayers, we're just going through the motions. We're doing it because it's the time to do it, and that's what we do. And there's nothing wrong with having regular times of prayer. Let me, don't get me wrong. But let's face it, a lot of times we do that because this is now the part of the service or the part of the thing that we do. I can remember pre-COVID going out to eat with some of the other professors. And the four of us are sitting at the restaurant. We bless the food. We're eating. About five, ten minutes into the meal, one of us looks up and says, did we pray over this? The other one says, I think we did. And then one of them said, yeah, I'm the guy that prayed. I remember now. And, we, and, and, and then I thought, boy, we really had a deep walk with God in that prayer because we don't even remember that we did it. Well, let's face it. That's the way a lot of times our prayers are in that they're just simply going through the motion. And let me just say, it's good to have a time in which you say, okay, I'm going to have my morning prayers. Our time in the service, you say, this is the time we pray. But God knows in His wisdom that that will become just a ritual to us. And so God has times of crisis. God allows us to go into seasons of trouble to learn so that we would know that prayer is more than simply a ritual. When I was a boy, my dad had a small lumber company in the Ozarks, and we had a family crisis that I won't go into details about, but it wasn't good. And uh, I remember uh, that evening looking for my dad. Uh, He wasn't in the house, on the front porch, not there, back porch, not there, not in the yard. Is he here? Yeah, there's his truck. He's here. So I went down to the mill, and I walked around the back of it, and when I did, I almost tripped over him. Because there, as I walked around the mill, there was my dad on his knees, and he was travailing with God in prayer. And it had such a profound impact on me to see my dad pray that way. And I'm going to tell you something. I, I, I want to say to fathers here, uh, <clears throat> Are your kids ever at risk of catching you praying? Because that's what's going on here. They are seriously praying. Folks, what is so great about being a Christian? What is the benefit and blessing? Folks, you and I have the refuge of prayer. We can take our burdens to the Lord. We can speak to Him. And whenever we pray, a miracle happens. The God who created the heavens and the earth listens to us. Because we have an advocate with the Father, Christ Jesus, who's praying on our behalf. And so this is a marvelous benefit and blessing that each and every one of us have the refuge of prayer. But that's not the only thing that's, that I see that Simon Peter and the people of God enjoy that Herod Agrippa doesn't. There's a second thing. Notice, not only do I have the refuge of prayer, second, I have the peace of God. Look at verse 6, and I think this is one of the most amazing verses in all the Bible. Let me just find out something. Do you, do you stress? Do you have a problem with worry? Do you have a problem with anxiety? Do you? Okay, what if you were supposed to die tomorrow? What if you, you're going to die in the morning? Would that have you... I mean, would that get your attention? Okay, they've already killed his friend. He's scheduled to die in less than eight hours. And what is Simon Peter doing? while the whole church is praying. Look at verse 6. But when Herod was about to bring him out, that night Peter was sleeping. I mean, this man's asleep in the electric chair. Think of that. What in the world is going on here? Well, I'm going to tell you, Charles Spurgeon, one of the great pastors of the 19th century, said something that I think all of you are going to like, and in fact, some of you are practicing it right now. And that is, he said... Sometimes the most spiritual thing that a person can do is take a nap. And some of you are being really spiritual right now. So pr- praise the Lord. So, but you think about it, folks, how it is 
that sometimes we as Christians hurt our witness. We hurt our testimony for Christ in that we are anxious and fearful and worried. Folks, these are strange days that we live in. And one of the ways that we can show the light of Christ in these strange days is that we show that we have the peace of God that passes all understanding. David in Psalm 4 is getting ready to face an army. David has 10,000 men. He's going to face an army of 50,000 men. It's going to be brutal. It's going to be rough. And his men are concerned. And so what does David do to show them his confidence? He actually goes right into the middle of the camp, unravels his night bed and says, guys, you can stay up worried all night if you want to. I'm going to bed. i got a big day tomorrow. And so you have Psalm 4 written, and it makes the point where the, he says, I will both lie down in peace and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me to dwell in safety. I'm in God's hands. And we, as the church, need to demonstrate Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6 and 7 where Paul says, Be worried about nothing. But in everything, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And so what is the second blessing that we can enjoy? We can have a peace that the rest of the world finds inexplicable and unexplainable. Why? Because the world didn't give it to us. The world can't take it away. It's what we have in Christ Jesus. And so, what is the first great blessing that we have that Herod Agrippa doesn't know anything about? You and I have the resource and ministry of prayer. What's the second great blessing that we have? We have the peace of God. But that's not the only thing. This third one is really kind of cool. The third benefit is that God really is at work in my life. Take a look at verse 7. Now, here's where God shows up. In verse 7, Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison. And now you have where Simon Peter has an angel for an alarm clock. Notice what happens here. And it says, And he struck Peter on the side. Now while you're at it, just if you've got some underlying that word struck because we're going to come back to it. But he strikes Simon Peter on the side. And it says <clears throat> that he struck him on, and raised him up. It said, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Think about it. You're laying there asleep. You're conked out. you got the, prison, you got the, the, the soldiers on each side on your, your chain to them. And, and uh, the angel, you, you, you hear some, Hey, wake up. And he's an angel. Okay. Well, now, <clears throat> if you've ever wondered whether or not the Bible or God has a sense of humor, just look at what happens next. God is going to move. He's going to deliver despite Simon Peter's lack of focus. You see, Simon Peter is not really awake. Moms and some dads, have you ever tried to dress your child, little child, when the child is not yet quite awake? And you're having to try and dress them. And you say, okay, now put your pants on. You know, one leg at a time. Okay, now let's put your socks and shoes on. No, socks first, then your shoes. I mean, notice what the angel does here. The angel has to tell him everything. It says <clears throat> in verse 8, The angel said to him, gird yourself. That's put on your pants. And tie your sandals. Put your shoes on. And so he did. And then the angel said to him, put your garment on and follow me. Why in the world is the angel telling Simon Peter how to dress himself? Because the next verse tells us that Simon Peter doesn't think he's awake. He thinks he's having a vision. Look at verse 9. So it says, <clears throat> So he went out and followed him, and did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. In other words, Simon Peter thinks he's still asleep, and he's thinking, oh my goodness, Man, I wish I wasn't going to die in the morning. I'd love to tell my friends about this dream I'm having. It's great. Wow, it's amazing. You think, oh, come on. Nobody could, could just sleep through having an angel visit. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Like I said, we're from the Midwest. We lived in Kansas City for a couple of years. And in Kansas City, um, some of you have 
uh, basements in North Carolina. Everybody has a basement uh, in Kansas City because there's a lot of tornadoes that come through. And we found that out not long after we moved there. Our kids were in middle school. And one night, as after we went to bed, about midnight, 1 o'clock in the morning, I mean, we woke up. The wind was terrifying. The house was shaking. Limbs, I mean, trash cans were flying by. And all of a sudden, we heard the, the air defense siren go off. And when it did, that let us know, tornado has been sighted. And so I jump out of bed. I said, Penny, tornado we got to get in the basement. She said, okay. <clears throat> I run out of the bedroom, open up Matt's door. I said, Matt. He sits up. He says, yeah. I said, tornado. Got to get in the basement. He said, okay. I run down Allison's room. Allison, yes. Tornado. Let's go to the basement. So I go into the living room, open up the basement door. I said, let's go. Let's go. There goes Allison into the basement. There goes, there goes Penny into the basement. Where's Matt? Where's Matt? I run back to his room. He's laying there in bed. I said, Matt. He said, what? I said, get up. He said, I am up. I said, wake up. I am awake. I said, get in the basement. I am in the basement. No, you're not. And I had to grab him by his hand and he fought me every step of the way and I really don't think he woke up during the entire tornado. So, is it possible for someone to sleep through anything like this? And the answer is, yes, I've seen it with my own eyes. Now what's the point here? I really think that's the way most of us walk through our Christian life. Completely out of focus and in a fog. Completely oblivious to all that's going on around us. He's having God do a miracle. God is at work. And if you'll notice, as He's going through all of this, and having the angel do a... There's a great insight to what the Christian life is about. Look at verse 10. And they walked past the first and second guard post, and when they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, it opened to them of its own accord. You see, <clears throat> it's interesting. God had, the angel had Simon Peter do everything he could do. <laughs> the angel wasn't going to dress it. You put on your own pants. You put on your own sandals. You put on your own garment. Now follow me. And then the angel did that which Simon Peter could not do. And that's open those gates. And this is the secret of the Christian life. The Christian life is a mixture of the ordinary and the extraordinary. The mundane and the miraculous. When a person becomes a Christian, when a person is saved, guess what? You still got to go to work the next day. You still got to go to school. Still got to pay your mortgage. Still got to take care of all of the normal things. Laundry still got to be done. All of, all of the normal humdrum things of life still happen for saved or unsaved. Doesn't matter, you know. What, what the difference is for you and me is that every once in a while, the gate opens by itself. You say, what is so great about being a Christian? What's so special about being a Christian? If, if I were to become a Christian here today, would it, would I, would it make me healthier? Well, maybe. Would it make me wealthier? I doubt it. Would it make me more popular? Definitely not. So what is it so great about being a Christian? What's so wonderful about being a Christian? I'm going to tell you what is so great about being a Christian. God is. God is what's so great about being a Christian. You and I were made by God for God. God is the one that we have this God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each and every one of us, and only God can fill it. What is so wonderful about being a Christian? You and I know God. We were created to enjoy God and glorify Him forever. I know God. You know God. God is the gift of the gospel. That is what is so wonderful. God steps into his life even despite Simon Peter's lack of focus. Not only was he delivered despite his lack of focus, he was delivered despite the church's lack of faith. Look what happens. It tells us then <clears throat> in verse 11, Peter came to himself. In other words, he says, well, you know, this is not a dream. I'm really delivered. And so in verse 12, what does he do? Well, I think I'll go to the prayer meeting. Well, the prayer meeting is at the home of Mary. Mary is the mother of Mark who wrote the, the Gospel of Mark. And evidently, she was a woman well-to-do. 
because she has one of those homes that's the great big compound shapes, rectangle shaped home in which they had a large courtyard, open courtyard in the middle. And that allowed much of the church then to gather there for the prayer meeting. And it, in those kind of homes, they have a large wall around the outside and a big gate. And so he goes to the gate and he knocks on the door. Now, when he knocks on the door, a little girl by the name of Rhoda, I always felt kind of sorry for Rhoda. Here she is mentioned once in the Bible, and it's with her kind of, you know, she just, what happens to her is, I, I, I get it. Because it says in verse 13, and as Peter knocked on the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. And when she recognized Peter's voice because of her gladness, she didn't open the gate, but ran in and announced. In other words, she got so excited, she forgot to open the door for him. And she runs back into the prayer meeting and she says, Hey everybody, Simon Peter's here. Verse 15, But they said to her, You are beside yourself. And she said, No, 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 he's really here. And the whole time the Bible says he continues knocking on the door. Hey, let me in. We can, we can kind of solve this problem. So what's going on here? Uh, more than one commentators pointed out that it was easier for Simon Peter to get out of jail than it was for him to get into the prayer meeting. So here we have a church that's praying and, they're, and they can't believe that God's answered their prayer. Uh, second, you know, they say, well, it's not him, it's his angel, which is the idea of a ghost. In other words, they found it easier to believe that they were being visited by a ghost than that God answered their prayer. So it would be easy to criticize them here, but let's just remember a couple of things. Uh, one, they did pray. They are praying. And second, isn't it true for you and me both that there's plenty of times in our lives that when God answered in an unambiguous way, we were surprised and amazed? And that's what's happened here. Well, notice here what happens in the end. Because he says in verse, remember back verse 7, where it says that the, the angel of the Lord woke Simon Peter, struck him on the side. Now, Herod Agrippa has got a speech to give, and so he gives the speech, and when he does, everybody says, the voice of a God and not of a man. Look at verse 23. And it says, and immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God, and he was eaten by worms and died. Now, this is one of those places in the Bible that we actually have an extra-biblical account. Josephus, the historian, also tells about this, and it happened just like this is telling. There's a parasite in the Middle East that if it gets into your belly, then they rep replicates and grows, and then it works its way out. You say, what, is, what happens to the person that's like that? Do you ever see the, the movie Alien? Do you remember what happened to the guy that had something in his belly? Yeah. That's what happened to him. It's pretty gruesome. Now, notice something here. Look at verse 23 again. Immediately an angel of the Lord struck him. It's the same word in verse 7. The angel of the Lord struck Simon Peter. The angel of the Lord struck Herod Agrippa. Both men ended up being touched by God, just like every one of us here. Eventually, one day, all of us will have this kind of encounter. What is the difference? The Christian lives a life that is touched by God in a gracious way. So what is it so good about being a Christian? Well, Simon Peter can let you know, I'd rather be a believer on death row than to be a prince in a palace and not know God. George Beverly Shea, who passed away a few years ago, in the many years whenever he was trying to figure out what he should do vocationally, he uh, was struggling with this, had the opportunity to lead in the Billy Graham kinds of meetings. He was wondering if he should go a different direction. His mother gave him a poem. And he took that poem and he put music to it. And it told him which way he ought to go. And that poem is one that you know and I know because he used to sing it all the Billy Graham Crusades. It went like this. And you know it. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. 
I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather. Nail pierce hand than to be the king of a vast and be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather this world afford. What does this chapter tell us? It tells us I'd rather have Jesus. Heavenly Father, thank you that you give us the refuge of prayer, that we can go to you and experience your tender mercies. Thank you that you give us a peace that the world simply does not have, nor can they understand. And then thank you for being real and in our lives. And God, forgive us those times that whenever we don't see your face and we don't perceive your hand, we question your goodness. Lord, help us always to realize just how you are ever ready and always part of our very existence. Lord, thank you for Jesus and how he's reconciled us to yourself. In Jesus' name, and amen. Let's all stand, and as we stand, our worship team's going to lead us, and as they do, let me just say to my dear, dear my, my Christian brothers and sisters, if you're here and God has just reminded you once again about how good it is to be a Christian and God's dealing with your heart, well, then do business with Him. If you, my dear friend, don't know Jesus, but the Lord has used something this morning to show you how beautiful He really is, I'm going to be right down here, and I would love to talk to you. So why don't you come as the worship team leads us. Okay. The Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father.
you again for being with us today, and thank you for Mr. Keith Lee for opening God's Word to us. Uh, what a great reminder that God is always at work in the believer's life, whether we recognize it or not. Um, I think our challenge for us this week is to be available and to be mindful and be looking for how God is working. And as Miss Faye Starlin told me, we need to ask God to show us where he's working and then ask to be able to join in that so that's the challenge. I'm going to close in prayer. Uh, Mr. Kim, Ms. Penny, uh, they'll be sticking around just for a few minutes. We don't want to hold them too long from lunch, uh, but they'd be happy to meet you and uh, introduce themselves to you. So um, let's pray. God, I thank you that uh, we have been able to open your word, Lord, to see how you work in marvelous ways. And God, we know that you are at work in each of our lives. Lord, forgive us where we don't recognize it. God, I pray that you'll open our eyes so that we see this more and more. God, I pray that we will be faithful to get on our knees this week, humble ourselves, Lord, and draw close to you. God, what an amazing thing. What a, just to say that, Lord, we know you, and, Lord, that you want to hear from us. Thank you, Jesus, for paying for our sins on the cross. God, be with us. Keep us safe, Lord, and just touch our country this week. In your name I pray. Amen.